how are you? How is it out there? How are you in <laughs> Denver? You know, I, I tell you, it, it, we were building up for, you know, moving out to Denver mentally for a long time. And um, the excitement went up there, but it has been every bit of the expectation. We're, wow. we're back in our little lovely house and we've done some fun things to remodel. And we bought a new tandem bicycle because Denver is just a wonderful place to ride bikes. And we bought some electric bikes and it just, and the kids, my oldest son was in the house and he lives now a couple miles away. And my youngest child, my daughter has just had another grand, uh, had a child. So we have a second grandson. So it's like everything we wanted, we got it, it. It's, it's feels great. And of course, you know, staying busy in spite of COVID, the work is fantastic. And, um, so we want for nothing. We're lucky. That is so wonderful, Carl. You're so deserving, man. You've done such good work for so many years, Thank you. man. It's so great yeah. that uh, that everything's come together for you. I'm so happy for you guys. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Now, of course, the next thing I need to do is figure out how someday to slow down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there's, uh, eh, I don't know. I, I go yeah, back and right. forth about it. I mean, definitely somewhat <laughs> slow down, but, uh, but not necessarily that much. I mean, not when you're having an impact, right? So it's like, you know. Right. Right. I had uh, a few different people that we've been interviewing and all of them, the one consistent thing is that, you know what? I love what I do. And if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Exactly. So, you know? Exactly. That's right. It is not work when you're having fun. Exactly. Exactly. So, all right. Well, if you would, tell us a little bit about what you are doing then, Carl, and a little bit about yourself as a background. Sure. And then we'll get into the more other stuff. So. So leaving, since leaving Westchester, you know, White Plains, where um, I came back home here to Denver and we, I've, I've always kept for, gosh, almost eight years now, I've kept uh, Robigo Energy going, which is just a consulting practice. And that's my platform for pretty much everything I've done and I'm doing. I have, um, I still have a relationship with Pace at the Energy and Climate Center and continue to work on some projects with them, although that's, you know, cut down significantly, just distance. Um, I've, um, I'm doing a lot of work in electric utility regulatory issues relating to clean energy, which I had been doing before. Since I've gotten here, I'm, I've now passed the 100 pieces of testimony uh, record in my, I was summing them up for testimony, for some testimony I filed the other day. I was like, wow, over 100. So the business of being an expert witness is still very good. And um, it means that the, I guess the arguments are still going on and I get to be a part of them. I picked up a couple of uh, really interesting relationships. I'm doing some work with Audubon Society, who is working on climate issues, habitat, and conservation are important to birds and people. Um, so helping them get engaged in these issues across the country. Doing some uh, great work with the, the Coalition for Community Solar Access. Uh, I saved it for item eight on your list, but we can talk, just I'll, I'll introduce it by saying that uh, they've teamed up with an astounding group of folks at a firm called Clean Vibrant Energy doing um, some amazing high resolution, big data modeling of the electric grid in the United States with an idea towards truly optimizing a build out to uh, carbon elimination and clean electrification of our society. Um, and uh, and then I've, I've also picked up, I, well, I, I reconnected with an old, and I've been picked up another engagement working with a company that makes jet fuel out of corn. And um, the wonderful thing about it for sort of sustainability advocates is that if you manage your environmental actions all the way back to the farm, you can actually make jet fuel that has a negative carbon score. Wow you can fly a plane and reduce carbon emissions at the same time. So uh, they're a little, they're, they're kind of a startup uh, phase now. They're, you know, they've got a plant and they're looking to build more plants um, over the, and they've got some big commitments for, you know, in the tens of millions of gallons of, of fuel to be delivered, but it, it's a chance to dig back into some sustainability work that I they did years ago 
um, working with a similar company that was making plastic out of corn. So uh, it's fun to be back in that, and it's appropriate. Now I'm in the middle of the country. Fantastic. So. Um, Carl, you're breaking up a little bit now and again, so I'm not okay. sure if it's the internet connection or whatever, but as a backup, would you mind, would it be okay, it, um, do you have an iPhone or a smartphone that we could do a memo recording and just keep it close to your mouth and then we'll have that as a secondary backup? Just yes. Like, let's get yes. To, yes. Let's yes. Get Let me, um, fantastic. So, well, will I get, will I get back? Um, no, if you just if you just record in your memo, you do a memo record, a voice memo. Oh, do on memo your phone. record. Yeah, okay. do a do okay. a voice memo on your phone. Just turn off your phone or we'll put it in your settings okay. so that nobody interrupts yeah. you because if a text comes in, it'll stop the recording. Yeah, yeah, um, right. And then yeah, just keep it if you could, sort of close to your mouth or close enough to your mouth that. Okay, that, um, voice that memo. Yep. And okay. use the, let me see. It's just, just an app, right? I've never yeah. actually done it before. You never have either. It's so funny. Never. It's, it's, the, it's really wild, man. How many people have never used that app? I use it all the time. So it's just. Uh, Let's see. Which one is it? It says voice. Well, on mine, it says voice memo. Do you have an Apple or iPhone or? Yes, an iPhone. Yeah, there should be a voice memo. You may need to do a search if you don't have it. Uh, voice memo. Mm -hmm. And this is a. It looks, it looks like a little red button right there. Somebody side. different, yeah. Let me find, I, I'm not. I'm, yeah, no, I, you, may not, you may not have it active, right? So you may need to download it. So. Yeah, voice memo, use the voice memo app, Apple support. Let me see. Okay, oh, I've seen that. I think I've seen that. Okay. Um, let me find it, just a second. Yeah, in mine, uh, it's, it's a black box with a red and red yeah, and right. left and then a blue That's line what it's, and white over to the right. So, yeah. And it's just what it's not doing give me a second here no worries, I'm gonna, time, time, time. I, I could cap on this world um what's weird about it is that it's it's not showing like maybe well obviously if you don't spell it right you're never gonna find it <laughs> let me try it again um there it is. Okay, it, it, I did have it. It just wasn't showing up in the search. Continue. Oh, I've never used it before. Allow while using app. Yep. And oh, okay. I did something okay. once. That's good. All right. That's it. So at the end of this, um, two things. Uh, I'll ask. Okay. You Let me see. I'm, I'm gonna look. I'm gonna look at the little ray beams here, and it, is it, it just, says, is it, "Is it recording for you?" That looks like uh, that's yep. it, right? It's just it's just going around, right? That's a good thing. So it yeah, seems... just keep it someplace close where where it'll pick okay. up good sound, and that'll be the backup just in case the uh, okay starts. And then we'll at the end of this, um, I'll ask you if you would be so kind to send me the audio file that you'll be of yours, and what'll happen when we do. Right. You, do, do you ever do a Zoom recording? So any closes out? No. Yeah, right, we've got all. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is also I'm going to go in the background here and shut down a couple of apps. It's funny because I did just order my um, new, uh, uh, let's see. Oh, that's okay. Um, my new modem and stuff. So in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be in great shape. But awesome. here we are. Okay, yeah, no worries. Okay, so let's see. Some extraneous stuff. Safari off. Uh, no reason to check email while we're talking. That that one is a gobbles up energy for some reason. Okay. Yeah. All set. Okay. How's it? So we'll keep talking here. Is this? Are you hearing me? Okay. I can hear you just fine. Yeah, it just, okay. It's been it just been breaking up a little bit now and again, and and okay. I know my tech guy is going to basically freak out if I don't have a backup. So okay, <laughs> fair <laughs> enough. Nineteen year old, and he's amazingly talented. I don't know if you saw that uh, video that's on my website about the about the whole launch. Uh, no, I haven't. At some point, take a look at it. He's a okay. Amazingly talented kid. It's uh, an awesome earth kind under the homepage, and you'll just see this video, and he just did an incredible job, and he's just amazing. Cool. All right, yeah, I will. Yeah. Yeah, really worth checking out. So, um, all right. So let's let's go back just a second. So tell yep. us a little bit about you and sort of your career path. I mean, in a you know in a relatively <laughs> short time, because you've done yeah. so many things. So, yeah. So, um, I guess you know, the, the, I'll just tell the energy story since I got out of the army, right? But I, I mean, I graduated. You know, after I went to college. I wanted to be a lawyer and, and the army was good enough to pay for my college and for my law school. I started as a, as a criminal attorney in the army. And then um, my last tour 
to be um, a, a member of the faculty at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. And uh, long story short, I had an opportunity. I heard there's this school called Pace that was offering an advanced degree in environmental law. And uh, the Army needed that. And uh, I thought, well, this might be fun, a specialty. Uh, so I went to, I taught school to cadets in the, in the morning. And I went to school at night to learn environmental law at Pace and just fell in love with it as a, as a legal thing. And also got, a, got to work with Dick Ottinger and Dave Woolley at the Energy and Climate Center and got involved with the externalities issues. And that really was um, sort of the, the, you know, the drug that hooked me. The idea of what was going on, the biggest, um, one of the biggest industries in the country and the world indeed. Um, and there were issues associated with environmental impacts that were huge and not being dealt with. Uh, it just struck me as a great opportunity. So I got really excited. I decided to end my time in the army and uh, I, I got out to, um, I, I was actually lucky enough to land as a law professor at the University of Houston uh, back home in Texas. And then a couple of years later, and Richard got elected governor, I got a chance to be a public utility commissioner. Um, it was it was interesting. A lot of a lot of people get that opportunity when they're a little older and they've actually done more. <laughs> I got a chance to do it when I was 34 years old. And uh, it was just astounding. I do you regulating, you know, $20 billion worth of utility industry in the state of Texas at a time when renewable energy was just coming on. We were we did wind farm in Texas at that time. Now it's, you know, the biggest state for wind in the country. Um, a lot of clean energy work going on, integrated resource planning. So I was in, I was stuck. Um, shortly thereafter, got a chance uh, to serve in the Clinton administration and um, to lead research and development programs for all of the renewable energy technologies. Uh, so all the guys that, that worked with me for the most part were physicists and engineers, and they were wonderfully patient in explaining things to me. Um, and I got to work with the labs and universities and, and of course, my great staff in, in advancing clean energy research and development. And then uh, since then, a string of other great things, advocacy work with Environmental Defense Fund, uh, consulting work with CH2M Hill, an engineering firm, um, policy work uh, and analysis with the Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, and uh, even some time as a utility executive with Austin Energy, the municipal utility in Austin, and with a global multinational, multinational energy company called AES um, that we had, uh, I was doing regulatory affairs in some 28 countries where we had or operated utility businesses. Plus, we at the time had the sixth largest wind company in the world. So I was doing development work with them and we launched a greenhouse gas credit business in conjunction with GE Energy. So oh, I've had a chance to do a little bit of everything and that set me up perfectly to be, you know, uh, a, a single uh, solo practitioner with lots of opinions about everything. So I, there uh, I am. You've done a tremendous job. So, so from your perspective, where are we at and where are we going and what's in the way? Yeah. You know, the, the, it has been building for some time. Back in, back in 2002, we, we, um, was it 2002? Um, yeah. We published a book called Small is Profitable at, when I was at Rocky Mountain Institute. And we, we essentially announced the coming of a revolution in scale that um, the grid, the electric grid and energy services would get smaller and smarter and right-sized for the needs. And that would be error of overbuilding power plants and electric infrastructure was over. Um, and uh, that the new world would be, like I said, smaller, smarter, right-sized. Um, we were just 20 years ahead of time, our time, I suppose. <laughs> um, which Rocky Mountain Institute often is. Uh, 
but but it, but we were right and uh the revolution in scale is progressing and electricity services and technologies and capabilities are now um moving toward the loads and the needs they serve uh, things like you know carrying around a little solar powered battery recharger for your phone when you make a long road trip a power plant in your backpack right and that you can re Charge using nature, um, which enables you to have communications and computing in your hand, uh, but also rooftop solar, community solar, all these kinds of things, storage taking off like gangbusters. So, so where we're at is that the the um, the economies of manufacturing scale now dominate over the economies of plant scale. So, not bigger better but more is better or as Amory Lovins used to say the the economics of auto manufacturing not cathedral building um, and and the people you know the hegemonists the the monopolists who um, believed they would hold it all and that electricity would be nothing but a commodity that um, were are sort of losing control they're fighting still have immense political power. Um, we see this in the news stories about these scandals that have happened in the Midwest and, of course, the ever scandalous state of Florida. But um, we, um, it, they, they're giving way. They've also given way, sadly, because we dithered on climate and now things are getting pretty damn serious. So um, we, we've got... an. Uh, growing impetus for having to do something, a growing capability for being able to do something about it. And all we have to do is change everything we know about how electricity is made and served to us. Uh, but I, we, I think we can, you know, I, I, it's not quite the computer revolution because we have a hundred years of history, but it is moving at that pace and with that significance. Um, so it's, it's, uh, we, we will dislodge, we will shut down the old stuff, we will reimagine and reconfigure things, and we will be better for it, and we'll be more climate responsible for it. As, a, as I said, what stands in the way is anything we've ever done before, which is usually what stands in the way of everything we want to do. Um, and of course, all the money that, and you know, expectations of power and a fair few uh, old guys, <laughs> Um, that, uh, you know, are planning their retirement and um, now need to retire maybe a little bit earlier. So. <laughs> so, so for the average person, like, what does it mean to them and what is it that they should be paying attention to and what can they right. do? Yeah, you know, I, I, I often find myself talking about this to people. There's a couple of things that come to mind. The, the first thing is that, that if, if they and we often pause and think about the amazing power of these cell phones and, and how computing and information and operation management have changed our lives. I mean, just, you know, and, and anybody who pauses for five minutes just will, oh my gosh, right? You know, that we use little sayings like, you know, that an iPhone has more computing power than an entire Apollo rocket ship that went to the moon, right? And, and but it is pretty impressive and we are doing an amazing number of things with our devices and with computers and with information. So, so um, if, if you analogize to that, and it's a pretty robust analogy, um, you can imagine what's possible in the electricity space. You know, and, and we're seeing it with electric cars and we're seeing it with rooftop solar that now is no longer unusual. It's common in almost every neighborhood. Um, and it'll be more common with, with things like people having storage units in their garages and, and and things like that so so for the ordinary person it's like here it comes again it's going to come in another way and uh it'll work for you and it'll probably be better and you'll be telling stories to your great grandkids about how you were here when they used to just make electricity at power plants you know that used to sit outside of town or that is now the art museum or the cultural center that's been converted to something useful 
um, or newly useful. Um, so that's so we have analogies and we can see them. We can see dramatic change in our lives. We can we can also see even glimmers in this crazy COVID thing of how we can we can get along and we can be more connected and yet be more remote. You know, we could do things like this interview, which you and I might have just done as a phone call before, but now we're doing with a video stream as well. Um, and so we're going to see we're going to see new ways of doing things, right? And and that means new opportunities for those who are willing to dive in, and maybe a little bit of you know sort of um, discomfort and uh, need for adaptation for those of us who try to stick to our ways. We see that, you know, with like the, the current political administration fighting hard to preserve a industry that if left alone would just like to die peacefully, you know, but, um, but, but nonetheless is being propped up in some places. So, so there'll, be, there'll be a little of that as well, uh, but our kids will teach us and we'll learn to go along and we'll eventually send you know, JPEGs uh, to your to our grandparents, and we'll send them back to our grandchildren as we already are doing. Um, so, so I think I think it means also that we're going to have the tools to deal with some of the most fundamental human problems we have. Uh, the biggest one is climate, but but close on the heels and actually not separate from it is justice. Um, we are, anytime a change happens, you realize kind of what was wrong, as well as what was right about the way things were before. And what was right was that everybody had, pretty much in the United States, for example, has access to electricity. That's, that's pretty freaking cool when you think about it. 99% levels of access to electricity, one of the most useful forms of energy data that has ever come along. Um, but what's wrong with it is that, it, it, you know, the distribution, and I don't mean mechanical distribution, the distribution of benefits and costs is rather unequal. And um, we're learning with this new opportunity to transition to clean energy that those opportunities are also even more unequal. The rich can afford to put solar on their roofs and to buy the most energy efficient appliances and equipment and um, and can afford very pricey electric cars. Uh, the poor, not so much. Uh, the pollution is still in urban neighborhoods. The diesel trucks still idle outside homes of the poor. Uh, so we have the, the, the fact the this is something we did not even question until somebody started saying, well, now we have the potential of the fact of an electric vehicle, which does not pollute while it idles. In fact, it doesn't even bother idling because it doesn't need to run. Um, again, now we know that the dirty buses, and the dirty trucks are in the dense urban neighborhoods and in the neighborhoods of the poor, and we, we can do something about it. And so we've, we've been given this chance because of technology because of change to, to make things right and to be more responsible for the climate at the same time. Um, this is the calling of our day. Wonderful. So let's uh, take a little talk, different time. How about if you share something that most people wouldn't know about you if they looked at the, just the stuff that's out there? Yeah, I'm trying, you know, I try to think about that. I'm pretty, I'm pretty, try to be pretty much an open book. Um, but and it's hard to say something like this without you know uh being a braggart uh but hey you know I've, my ego's in pretty good shape so um i'll start with a i'll start with a brag uh i was an eagle scout when i was 12 years old uh legally as fast as you could possibly do it i had the opportunity to skip several grades so i i was the youngest second lieutenant in the army uh when i became a second lieutenant at the age of 19 um, and then I just used all that time to catch up and get into the law business. Um, my, my superpowers, and this is maybe obvious, but, or not obvious, but my superpowers I claim 
is that I, I, um, I'm really good at translating, not different languages, but different versions of English. So uh, I mentioned before that I had a chance to work with a bunch of engineers and physicists when I was in the Department of Energy. I've jumped into this electric utility business where there's so many technical issues going on. I cut my teeth as a, as a trial lawyer in the Army. And um, I'll, I'll take a, a minute to just tell a little side story here. But um, when, when I was in the Army, we were having um, we had, a, we had a breakdown at our laboratory, our big army laboratory. Um, it was against the law for soldiers to smoke marijuana. It still is. And uh, the way you found out was by testing their urine, right? So every now and then, you know, you'd get a random pee test and then they'd send the samples to the lab and the lab completely broke down. Um, they, were, they were sloppy and thousands and thousands of convictions and discharge discharges had to be re-examined. And faith among the commanders in the technical processes was totally destroyed. They were not gonna subject their soldiers to a testing regime that couldn't be relied upon. Um, you know, whether it said they were clean or dirty in terms of marijuana and their, you know, or tetrahydrocannabinol, in their urine, the commanders wanted the process to have integrity. So we reversed, like I say, thousands of convictions. And I was a I was a trial lawyer, a prosecutor, just at the time we were trying to rewrite the keel. Um, so I got a chance to explain to a group of pretty grizzled soldiers uh, in some legal and administrative proceedings just exactly how gas chromatograph spectrometry testing of urine samples works and how you can how a chain of custody can be an important element in maintaining the integrity and when you'd know you had a righteous test and when you didn't and and um, I just I fell in love with the idea of of understanding the tech um, I will say I'll go all the way back my dad bought univac computers for the Air Force when he was in the military and uh, loved explaining science and technology to us, so I inherited it. Since being in electric utility space and in renewable energy and energy efficiency, I've had a chance to do that. So I, I, um, people, you know, people talk about things like how does sunlight make electricity and how do we store the electricity and how does the grid have to operate and remain in balance and and what are all those issues? And I love translating those into ordinary language, into policy and regulation, into uh, rates and uh, as, as, part of a as part of regulation as well. And I've learned first and foremost that in spite of all my blathering on and talking, what I really love doing, and it, it is, I think it might be my greatest superpower, is I know how to ask good questions. Wonderful. So here's a question for you. You have a tremendous amount of expertise in this space and given that you are the translator, what do you think is one unique tool or tip or tactic that people need to know but just don't at this point? It is, I think it's how to ask questions. You know, we're so, we are so focused on announcing ourselves, stating our opinions, our social media encourages us, you know, uh, uh, being fiercely independent and strong of character suggests you're supposed to assert yourself. And these are all true things. Uh, but asking questions and asking the right kind of question and the right tone of question in the right setting, you know, for example, I, I you know, if you did not know this, if you were ever having, if you need something from someone, especially a bureaucrat, um, the best question to ask is, what would you do if you were me? Right? Um, and it, it, it's, it is a question, what would you do? But it's powerful because it puts the person you're asking the question to on the same footing with you. It, asks, it invites them to participate in your, in your problem and in your lack of information and gives them a chance to fill you in. And it's, Yes, the question. So you could ask, what would you do? Or what should I do? But it's even more powerful to ask it as what would you do if you were me? 
Um, there are questions you ask that you know the answer to. Trial lawyers know this all the time, right? They say never ask one unless you do. But they're also open-ended questions. You know, when I was a, I learned this when I was a commissioner. First of all, staff and parties were eager to tell you what they thought. And, you know, um, if you get a chance to sit as the commissioner, you shouldn't have to worry about how you look up there. You already have the title. So it's okay to say, I don't know, and please explain it to me. You know, so I just, it is probably um, in this day and age, especially in this day and age of loud and obnoxious political and, you know, sort of oftentimes business figures who espouse their every opinion in 240 characters or less. Um, I, I, I think this is a good time to ask, to just find out ways, think of all the ways you can ask questions and, and get better at that. Um, and, you know, a question invites a dialogue and God knows we could use a lot more of that. Excellent. Thank you so much. So uh, we, we like to start sort of like where people had their tough times, the things that almost broke them, but then led to a change that was dramatic. Could you share with us one of your worst clean energy moments and what happened in <laughs> the story and, and where you, what, what did you learn from it? So, Yeah, yeah. Thanks for giving me that question in advance so I could kind of think about it and, and, and dig up all those old bad feelings. Uh, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Here's, here's the one that, that, that was most profound that I probably learned most from. Was, um, so I had a chance to, um, to be the first person to take value of solar analysis and use it in creating a value of solar tariff. And the concept was pretty simple, that instead of just doing um, rates based on costs, which is the old utility cost plus model, that we'd actually do a rate for solar that was based on value. And then we'd compensate people who made energy with solar customers at the value that their solar provided to the entire system. Um, and this is when I was at Austin Energy and we were, my mission was to increase the amount of solar. So the idea of paying people, not what the solar cost, but what the solar was worth, the value was actually a new idea in 2011. And it's, it's had some legs. It's turned out to be a pretty good idea, and it's had some influence in the industry. Um, what I was not prepared for was an absolute attack. Uh, websites put up, um, op-eds and articles and interviews given um, by people in the solar industry attacking the idea. So... Um, reason why is very complicated it has to do with that old if it isn't a yogi Berra saying it should be where you stand depends on where you sit um it's it's about getting comfortable with an old regime versus you know what you could get if you had to work a little harder in a new regime um and fear of the unknown and resistance to change all these things i attributed in as we were talking earlier on to do you know incumbent industries but even the new guys can be guilty of so you know it got so bad that um a friend of mine a reporter at utility dive wrote an article asking you know is the alliance for solar choice splintering the rooftop solar industry you know back in uh, it was 2014 or so when he wrote that piece and interviewed a bunch of people. So it, was, it wasn't just me. We were going through a tough time trying to figure out what we were gonna be when we grew up. And uh, it wasn't quite, you know, the sort of the Lord of the Flies, but you know, it, it, was, it, was, uh, it, was, a, it was a frothy moment in the solar business. And, and it hurt, it hurt. I was really proud. I thought I'd come up with something that would sort of let pathway towards resolution of some issues and move to a positive direction. And I expected resistance from, you know, the coal burners and, and the others, but I did not expect a full frontal from what I thought were my friends. Um, we've, we've reconciled mostly because they've realized that I was right, uh, but I'm being a little funny. Um, <laughs> I've, 
I learned a little too, uh, and we got through it. But that was that was a tough, and uh, I, I'm not sure I could have been more prepared for it. That's probably the question I'll ask myself a lot, you know. Yeah, no, I mean it's it's it is really fascinating, right? So they say that uh, <laughs> certain groups, when they get together a firing squad, they all line up in a circle, you know. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> right. Right. You know, I mean, the, just the way we humans, for whatever reason, we find. So, I mean, right. I, you can see it all across the board. Just the most, this, just the slightest disagreement, and all of a sudden, the other person who you thought was your friend is now your biggest enemy, and you hate them, and it, you want to kill right. them. Right. And it right. just drives me crazy, really. Actually, so it's just yep. a whole different thing. Um, yep. And we always should see it coming, but we don't. No. You yeah. know, so yeah. Yeah, you do what you can, right? I and mean, that's all you can do. You do right. the best you can, put it out there, and then uh, strive to f try to find some common right. ground and higher ground and reach that uh, next level because uh, otherwise we're going to all be gone, which would be really bad. Which actually, on a right. side note, just for a second, so I don't know if you saw this movie, Planet of the Human, speaking of people who are normally aligned who come together to go and kill each other. Have you seen that movie? No, I haven't. Have I you heard it, about it? It got so much, yeah, it got so much press. Yep. That it's like, oh, I'm not sure I could even enjoy this now. No, I don't you know what enjoy. side of You can't enjoy yeah, it. Yeah. You can't enjoy right. it. It's horrible. It's horrible. Here you yeah. got a guy, you know, Michael Moore, that you would normally think, right. and his buddies, who you would normally think would be somewhat aligned on some of these things, basically saying, yep, seven billion humans, we're horrible. We should just get off the planet. We should <laughs> basically kill ourselves because we're horrible and there's nothing we can do. And everybody that you thought was doing good things, they're not. They're really horrible <laughs> people, too. And we should just, we should just string them all up. They should just be gone. And, you know, I really feel like saying to him, you know, great, man, lead the way. You know, you're right. Take yourself out of the gene pool. Yeah, take right. Take your kids, take your grandkids, just get off this. No hope, just be done. Move, leave, right. done. I mean, it was just so hopeless. And that was actually one of the reasons for this podcast was because I just got really tired of the fact that people are just putting out there's so much doom and gloom in the world. And you know what? There's a lot of hope. And you can either look at the bright side or you can look at the negative side. If you want to look at the negative side and go down the hopeless path, I, you know, nothing too much that we can do. But you know what? That's not the way I want to live. And that's not the way I want my kids right. and grand grandkids to deal with stuff. So, well, and the, hum it, the normal you know. human reaction, if it's not to turn inward and shoot each other, is is to to ignore it, right? You can't handle that level of it. So then you've done even more, then people won't even try to make positive steps, right? It's so disabling and disempowering. And, and I do, we do need to be shocked. We do need to hear the magnitude of these things. I am not one for sugarcoating things. It, the climate is changing, let's just say it, right? But um, you're right. It just, the, the, these hopeless messages don't work. So my book recommendation, by the way, the first one on my list is Ishmael, which has at its heart, you know, by Daniel Quinn, has at its heart that the same basic thesis that there are, you know, two kinds of human societies, leavers and takers. Um, and we've been wallowing and being takers for 10,000 years, but it doesn't have to be that way. You know, Leavers actually had a 290,000 year run before the takers took over. And there's hope that we can reclaim some of that, you know, that sort of better instinct of being Leavers rather than takers. Um, so that, anyway, that's a, a good segue. Hey, by the way, side note, I, I have a hard stop at the end of the hour, so I want to I'm the one giving the long answer. You do. You told me you had all the time in the world. You didn't tell I me. Did, I, I okay. did. I did, and I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get on the phone with the utility in Virginia. Yeah, no worries. Okay, so let's keep going then. Okay, tell us yeah. about your uh, aha moment when you actually got it. Your aha moment. When so something came you know out. the values. Yeah, the value is solar thing. It makes for a good store for clean energy people. And I'll tell you, the aha moment was sitting at the table with Tim and Leslie and Fred, the guys on my team, as we were developing it, and deciding to call it the value of solar. It was, it was um, as I look back on it, it was the most profound thing. It was, and, and my, my staff actually argued against me. Uh, they, they, either they said, you know, Carl, we, we need to call this the, uh, you know, the, the earned flow back compensation rate or something, you know, and, and so because nothing the utility business ever does is, can be comprehensible. You know, if, we, if, if people could understand it pretty soon, they'd want to participate in it, you know? So we, we need to use code. And I, and I insisted that we would call it what it tried to be and that, that that would help it last 
it would be, it, it turns out to have been a reference point to go back to. You know, are we sticking with what we're trying to do? It made it a term that the policymakers could under, understand, the utility regulators could understand, the citizens could understand. It having the courage to speak plainly about what we were trying to do was amazingly powerful and probably was one of the biggest aha moments uh, that I've had working on this clean energy stuff. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. Pulse all around, short, succinct, amazing, and mind blowing answers to these quick questions. Are you ready there, yep. sir? There we go. Yes. First, best advice you've ever received. This one, it takes a little explaining because the advice is um, something that I often heard by those in power trying to keep women and minorities from, from uh, aspiring too much. The advice is saw the wood in front of you. And in a condescending way, it's often accompanied by a pat on the head. It's like, don't you trouble yourself with a promotion. You just do you just do your job and good things will happen. The, but the truth is that it's really good advice. I've never paid attention to what the next thing would be. I just really focused on what I was doing and doing it as well as I could. And that itself has led to every great opportunity that I've had. So um, not as a tool of, like I say, condescension or keeping somebody down, but as a reminder in this world where we're always asking about where the next gig is, that the next gig is going to be even better if you ace this one. Uh, so it's, it's, it's good advice for its message, and it's good advice for, for um, thinking about how not to use that advice as well. Excellent. Thank you. Share one of your personal habits that contributes to your right. personal success. I, I mentioned asking questions and not being afraid to ask questions, trying ideas out on people, taking time to rest my brain. I love riding my bicycle and I don't ever work or think about work when I'm riding my bicycle. Um, but also I have a morning ritual of surfing the news in the industry. I spend an hour with coffee and just see what's going on just to let it kind of wash over me. And, uh, and, it, and it gives me a, it gives me a start and, and, and the patterns form in the back of my head uh, while I'm working on the stuff in the front of my head. So, Excellent. Thank you so much. An internet source that people should listen to or might listen to that you'd recommend? I've done a lot of uh, podcast listening and maybe it's I talk too much, um, but I do read I do read through, you know, all of the U.S. energy news, regional news reporters, Northeast, Southeast, Western. I uh, utility dive because it's written with the utility audience in mind. And uh, I shouldn't just listen to the way things, the way I say things. Um, but I also find a lot of value and a little fun in, in Twitter. I'm pretty good at sticking to just energy and environment related stuff. Um, so I don't indulge in too much personal and too much uh, political. Um, and so as a focused group, uh, it's, it's a pretty valuable resource. Just, you just can't get in with, you know, too many gifts and too many, uh, too many jokes and not hardly at all any political stuff. Great. You already told us about the book. So if you had a magic wand and could wave it and change one thing in the world, what would it be? The best part of COVID without the disease, uh, you know. I, I again, I, I've been should I ride my bike. I um, for a magical few weeks there, you could ride your bike on the streets and not be worried about about somebody running up behind you and running you off the road. We 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 talked to our neighbors because we were all walking, uh, even at six feet apart with masks on. Talked. We didn't drive by each other. We were polite in standing in line. We believed we were sharing in a common effort about something. We asked questions about what was important in life. We spent more time with our family. Um, it, it, I, I'd have us recreate that 
without the disease and 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 get back to community outstanding all right wtf or f weather time fudge or weather yeah. time fun most extreme weather event that you lived through and tell a tale or something that you did it was really fun and send, tell us the weather about right we were at mile marker 72 on uh, i-45 in the woodlands texas when hurricane ike came in in 2008 got a chance the fun part was uh after cowering in the closet for a couple of hours hearing the silence going out and looking up from the center of the eye and seeing the circle of the eye just freaking awesome and on awe inspiring um then we got back in the closet as the edge of the eye came back over um and then for three weeks uh, I guess I'm a big fan of community. We rolled our barbecues into one neighbor's driveway. We slowly emptied out our freezers as the electricity gave way and, the, and things would go bad. We shared. We told stories. We walked. We helped people who had needs. Um, it was uh, it was also it was awesome and it was awe inspiring in its own way as well. Yeah, amazing. Okay, what's one thing that you are energized about today, most energized about? Yeah, I told you earlier on, I'm working with the Coalition for Community Solar Access, which is the business association of, of businesses trying to do community solar. And we partnered with a firm called uh, uh, Vibrant Clean Energy, um, led by a guy named Dr. Christopher Clack. And look up BCE and Clack and see that it, it's starting to buzz a bit, but he's He's just brilliant, but he, he was working on weather models and his, his, the genius of his idea was that you could take weather modeling and make it work in the utility space. Um, so we, CCSA, uh, the coalition, uh, set up a project working with him and asking him to bring his expertise to modeling the electric utility industry system and where it would go. And um, it rebels in resolution. It's down to one kilowatt. It's down to three square kilometers. Um, and it does the entire country. It has, is working with 10,000 times more data points than a traditional utility model. And it is enabling us to find out just how powerful distributed resources and intelligent co-optimization of our energy resources can be. Um, when we run a scenario to electrify the economy and reduce carbon emissions by 95% by the year 2050, by taking advantage of that optimization and thinking about transmission and distribution lines and costs and, and the cost of fuels and the cost of energy and all of these things at the same time, we can see four to five bill, trillion, trillion dollars in energy savings for the people of the United States by 2050. So we're talking half a, half a trillion dollars just if we optimize around electricity and what it's currently serving. And it goes up to four to five trillion dollars if we electrify heat and transportation as well. So the, the, I started by telling you about, you know, this smallest profitable and this revolution in scale. Don't get me wrong. It is not about shutting down every large scale plant. Large scale plants have value. My second book recommendation is a Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold and a short story called Thinking Like a Mountain. Uh, in which he famously says, you know, we are remodeling the Alhambra, this famous palace in Spain, with a steam shovel, and we're proud of the yardage. He says, we will hardly forego the steam shovel, which after all has great, several great uses, but we're in need of more elegant use, right? And so we, we this model, this modeling exercises shows us that we can make more elegant use of our electricity infrastructure and make greater use of distributed energy resources and save a ton of money and solve our climate problems 
in large part waiting for the atmospheric uh, concentrations to go down. Um, it's a win, 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 win scenario. You know, there's everything about it. Oh, and the jobs multiply, right? And the savings multiply and the rates go down. And it's, um, and it's, it's because we now finally have the power to apply this modeling, which, which, like I say, people in the weather business have already used, but the old electric utility industry haven't. And applying this high, the big data friendly modeling platform to solving our energy problems. Um, oh gosh, I just, I get all shivery. That, and as I mentioned, I'm working, I think I mentioned, uh, yeah, I did. Um, I'm working with some old friends on um, using corn to, and that's grain quality corn to make jet fuel in a matter and with farming techniques that have, give us a negative carbon footprint, um, which is another win 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 kind of situation. It's amazing. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so so much we've got fun. a couple of minutes. We're going to, I want yep. to, but we're going to track. Grand finale, end with you sharing a piece of parting advice to everybody in the best way that people can connect with you if you want them to. Yep, people can connect with me by following me on Twitter, at Robigo Energy, uh, and see my pithy opinions or the things I like to share, um, which is more the latter than the former. Um, I have a website, robigoenergy.com, so you can sort of track that there and reach out to me. I have an email address, carl at robigoenergy.com. I'm not afraid of emails. Um, the advice I'll give to everybody though, and, and I don't know your audience, and I hope it's a big and broad one and grows every day, but um, the advice I'll give and the thing I've learned from uh, being around, especially young people who, who, who are getting involved in these issues is step up and step in. You know, everybody has something to offer in addressing the problems that affect us all. Um, that, that also means, by the way, you step up and listen to other people as well, but you step into the dialogue because um, being a bystander in this is not an option. We all have a responsibility. Uh, again, the best parts of what we've seen in COVID, right? Uh, the, the, the best parts of any major transformation, the best parts of, of Black Lives Matter, of, of, of people of all colors and, and, and economic situations and, and geographic locations getting together and saying, you know, we will rise up to stop injustice, to stop a disease, to stop destroying our planet. All of these, by the way, I'm really excited people are seeing are tied together. Um, so everybody has to be involved. Everyone has to step up and step in because it's uh, it's a full contact sport step up and step in thank you